And that's gonna take a minute. I'm still waiting. Frustrating. That is the story about the nuclear subs. Virginia class. <laughs> I'm sending this to Instagram right now. <laughs> uh, money coming in at a trickle. <laughs> During the meeting, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also pledged to boost the domestic defense budget. He said the UK will, for the first time, move the baseline commitment from 2% of the GDP to 2.5% of the GDP. That means over $6 billion in the next two years. This is how Sunak assesses the threats that AUKUS faces. But more broadly about China, I think it's just clear that it represents a systemic challenge to us in the world order. It's a country with fundamentally different values to ours, and its behavior over the past few years has been concerning. More authoritarian at home, more assertive overseas. The three leaders said in a joint statement that their countries have worked for decades to sustain peace, stability, and prosperity around the globe. And they say that Monday's deal will help them advance these goals. The price tag on the submarines themselves is only the tip of the iceberg. The deal's funding goes far beyond that. It extends to building a submarine base and training skilled workers, including maintenance specialists. Total costs will soar as high as 250 billion U.S. dollars over the next three decades. But the move still won bipartisan support in Australia. Opposition leader Peter Dutton said he would back the submarine deal come hell or high water. An expert compared the investment to paying an insurance premium. Given the much more turbulent and disturbed and challenging geostrategic circumstances we face today, it's, uh, it's a hike in the insurance premium, if you like, uh, for national security and the defense of Australia and its interests. On the other hand, China said Tuesday that the US, UK and Australia have gone further down a dangerous road. Taiwan is voicing confidence in its submarine program, too, with support from the UK. Despite facing difficulties, Taiwan's defense minister said that as of now, everything is going according to plan. For decades, Taiwan has been unable to buy conventional submarines from other countries. That says those countries sought to avoid angering China. Despite that risk, the British government granted more than $200 million worth of export licenses to companies linked to submarine making. That number comes from the first nine months of 2022 and is more than the previous six years combined. In response, Beijing urged the UK to refrain from providing military support to Taiwan authorities. Tensions between Beijing and Taipei are at their highest point in decades. China sees the democratically governed island as part of its territory and opposes Taiwan having any diplomatic relations with the West. The U.S. just laid out its biggest defense budget increase in years. That's to counter China. The Pentagon on Monday asking Congress for over $840 billion for 2024's defense budget. 
That's a 3% increase over 2023 and a whopping 13% increase over 2022. This follows on the heels of China's announcement that Beijing will increase its defense budget by 7.6% at $230 billion. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin saying Monday that the budget would allow the Pentagon to invest in capabilities that will ensure we maintain a ready, lethal, and combat-credible joint force with a laser focus on China. Noting the pacing challenge posed by the Chinese regime, as well as addressing the acute threat posed by Russia. Washington's budget would boost areas like missile and air defense, including a push into hypersonics. U.S. Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks adding the expanded budget would aid U.S. deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. She said, our greatest measure of success is to make sure the PRC leadership wakes up every day, considers the risks of aggression, and concludes today's not the day. PRC stands for the People's Republic of China, the Chinese regime's official name. On top of that, it seems the U.S. is changing the way it views warfare. The Pentagon recently publishing a report noting U.S. adversaries intend to win without fighting. The U.S. has historically viewed war through the lens of peace or all-out conflict, while for many countries, war is viewed on a continuum. The statement notes, China in particular has rapidly become more assertive. It is the only competitor capable of mounting a sustained challenge to a stable and open international system. It references a famous example, the 1999 book by two Chinese colonels called Unrestricted Warfare. It covers the idea of taking over another country without firing a single shot. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, writing in the statement's board, if the United States does not compete effectively against adversaries, it could lose without fighting. The Pentagon is set to test out this approach through a series of war games and experiments. Taiwan is showing off new models of its military drones, all of them produced on the island. Here's a closer look at what officials are saying about the technology. Since the Russian-Ukrainian war started last February, drones have attracted more and more attention from the world and people. Taiwan says its new domestically made drones are key to its asymmetric warfare capability. That means keeping its forces agile, so they're better able to face off against the Chinese military and its far greater numbers. In a rare display of its drone capabilities, the National Chengshan Institute of Science and Technology highlighted its latest models. Among them, the Albatross 2 surveillance drone plus combat drones that operate with GPS satellites. He urged Taiwan's troops to learn to use the technology, calling the drones quite advanced. Bold use is one of the options available to us. Beijing has ramped up military activity near the island in recent years. It claims the island is part of its territory, though the Chinese Communist Party has never ruled Taiwan and has threatened to take it over without renouncing the use of force. The House Energy and Commerce Committee are seeking a retraction from Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm and demanding that she testify immediately. Those requests after she praised the regime in China for its efforts to combat climate issues. She made the controversial comment during an interview last Friday for the 2023 South by Southwest Conference in Austin, Texas. Here's what she said. We can all learn from what China is doing to lessen its carbon footprint. What's more, she commended Beijing for being very sensitive on the climate issue and called its investments in clean energy encouraging. In a letter to her, GOP lawmakers said they were deeply troubled by her alarming remarks. They added that her words raised serious questions about her judgment and priorities as energy secretary. The letter went on to say her comments, quote, at best, reflect an uninformed, unserious perspective on the goals and intentions of the Chinese Communist Party and its abysmal human rights and environmental record. The lawmakers pointed out that China poses one of the greatest threats to the U.S. while continuing to be one of the world's worst polluters. The Energy Department did not respond to a request for comment by airtime. The security minister and cyber warfare capabilities. 
Lee's appointment comes as Washington pushes to restore military communication with China. That stopped after former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan last August. Responding to Lee's appointment, a Pentagon spokesperson said the U.S. military could not comment on media reports about China's leadership changes. He added that the DoD had been clear about wanting to maintain communications with the Chinese military. The FBI and State Department have government might have paid more than once for medical supplies, equipment, travel, and salaries connected with the lab. Cutler has investigated white-collar crime and health care fraud for over two decades. The information she gathered was used to launch a new probe by the U.S. Agency for International Development. The money in question came from both that agency and the National Institutes of Health. Lockdown order of helping Ukraine fight Russia is a vital U.S. interest. Former President Trump answered, no, but it is for Europe but not for the United States. That is why Europe should be paying far more than we are, or equal. And he said if he were president, he'd end the war in 24 hours or less. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis also said that the war isn't a vital U.S. interest. He also added this, the U.S. should not provide assistance that could enable Ukraine to engage in offensive operations beyond its borders. F-16s and long-range missiles should therefore be off the table. But Poland appears to trust Ukraine wouldn't fly fighter jets into Russian territory. The Polish prime minister said they may send MiG-29 fighter jets to Ukraine in four to six weeks. And later on Tuesday, a Russian fighter jet made physical contact with a U.S. military drone over international waters over the Black Sea. The Pentagon explains. Uh, what, we, what we saw, again, were, were fighter aircraft dumping fuel in front of this uh, UAV, uh, and then getting so close to the aircraft that it actually damaged the propeller on the MQ-9. Uh, we, we assess that it likely caused some damage to the Russian aircraft as well. And he said the State Department is raising concerns over the incident directly with the Russian government. Jason Perry, NTD News. Now turning our attention to Africa. The death toll from Cyclone Freddy is climbing into the hundreds. It ripped through southern Africa this past weekend for the second time in a month. As of Tuesday, the total death toll from Cyclone Freddy has reached over 220 in Malawi, Mozambique, and Madagascar. Malawi reported the most deaths, 190. Cyclone Freddy is one of the most powerful storms ever recorded in the southern hemisphere. It first made landfall in Mozambique late last month and hit the region again last Saturday. It was too bad in the night, but now that it is daytime, I can feel the loss. I have never seen something terrible like this. My neighbors' houses are all gone. The family members are gone. They are missing. In some instances, the father is alive, but the wife and the children are gone. Malawi's second largest city and commercial hub is among the most hard-hit areas. Communication networks and electricity supplies in the storm area have been cut. Severe flooding and rain damaged roads and bridges, hampering rescue efforts. The child was stuck up to her head in the mud. She was crying for help. Even though the water was very strong, we managed to cross and rescue her. It was very difficult, but we managed to pull her out. Authorities in Malawi say over 500 people have been injured and dozens are missing. More than 22,000 people there were seeking shelter. Forecasters say Cyclone Freddy could sweep through Mozambique again, bringing more wind and rain. According to the World Meteorological Organization, it could be the longest-lasting tropical cyclone ever. We don't want to see this war escalate beyond what it already has done to the uh, Ukrainian people. The U.S. has yet to recover the drone. This move could be seen as a dangerous escalation during a critical period of fighting. A new poll asks voters who would they pick if the presidential election were to happen tomorrow. What it showed about former President Donald Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Plus, a winter storm pummels the Northeast. How the mid-March nor'easter is affecting people right now. Deputies say he's a known gang member. According to the sheriff, Parks opened fire at somebody at the Northside Hills apartments around 1 a.m., and that's when one of the bullets went through a window and struck that little girl. 
from about 100 yards away with a rifle and uh, was just spraying bullets. And uh, unfortunately, one of the rounds uh, that he was spraying, shooting at this other person, went through the bedroom window of the victim uh, and struck her and killed her instantly. Deputies say Parks has an extensive criminal history. If you see him, call 911. New tonight, a jury convicted a man of fatally stabbing his ex-girlfriend at a child's birthday party. The jury found Pedro Navarro Zelaya guilty of felony murder. It happened in Roswell in 2019. At the time, police said several people at the party intervened, and Zelaya stabbed himself in a fight over the weapon. A judge sentenced him to life in prison. The family of a slain in the 1990s. While the city is about one-third black, most of the homicide victims in 2022, more than three out of every four were black. And of these black homicides, get this, over 70% of the cases go unsolved. In the first three weeks of 2023, the city's crime rate is up 61%. Chicago's Magnificent Mile has seen several high-profile stores close up and abandon ship. Stores like Macy's, Old Navy, Banana Republic, Gap, Uniqlo, and Timberland have all closed down. The vacancy rate in the, in the Magnificent Mile is up almost 30%. Six years ago, according to Craig's, it was <coughs> under 5%. To combat robberies, Mayor Lightfoot said not to, quote, use money, if at all possible, use other forms of transactions to carry out, <laughs> to carry out your business. What's next? Laws demanding cash control? Journalist William Kelly said, and I'm quoting him, the policies that really destroyed State Street and Michigan Avenue and the Magnificent Mile were the one-two punch of lockdowns, the looting, but also the policies that continue to this day. For someone shoplifting up to $1,000, there are no consequences, end of quote. Indeed, County State Attorney Kim Fox essentially promised not to prosecute anybody who shoplifted a value of less than $1,000. Shockingly, shoplifting increased. In response, Lightfoot said merchants should lock up their merchandise. In a press conference, she said, quote, we shouldn't be locking up nonviolent individuals just because they can't afford to pay bail, end of quote. In 2020, Lightfoot promised to cut $80 million from the police budget, a promise, thankfully, she failed to keep. And her relationship with the media has been, well, let's just say, interesting. Do you really believe that the criticism of you is 99.9% based on the fact that you're a black woman? So you said about 15 things, most of which were wrong. Your question, frankly, was insulting. Will you recall, rescind, your violent tweet to uh, call to arms? No, let, yes, him, let, him, let, him, let him talk. He, er, the more he talks, the more stupid he sounds. If you don't want to abide by those rules, you can take your nonsense someplace else. Because I am about full up with you. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. You will stop speaking. You will stop speaking. You're, you're, you're full of crap. And that's the nicest thing that I can say. If you do not stop, you will leave. I will ask you to leave, and I will make sure that the police take you out of here. And let me be clear with you. I'm not patting myself on the back. God. Okay. You are you one of the rudest people I've ever seen. Your office says that you invited black and brown journalists to, to this round of interview. Uh, why? I think in this one day, when we are uh, looking at uh, the two-year anniversary of my inauguration, as a woman of color, um, as a, a lesbian, it's important to me that diversity is put front and center. Sir, just a moment. I oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I and I appreciate it. Sorry. And, and you haven't been called on. You know the rules. So I, you'll get called on when it's your time. Hey, dude, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Back up. Back up. Back up. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Wow. According to an article in The New Yorker, Susan Sandlowski Garza, a councilwoman who actually helped Lightfoot pass a $15 minimum wage, said about Lightfoot, I have never met anybody who has managed to tick, she used a different word, tick off every single person they come in contact with. Police, fire, teachers, aldermen, businesses, manufacturing, end of quote. And the same article said the police department has more than a thousand vacancies and that the city is facing a similar challenge in staffing trains and buses and keeping riders safe. She implemented police anti-chase policies 
And get this, Lightfoot's campaign sent out an email to public school teachers asking them to ask their students to volunteer for her campaign and that the teachers should give them class credit for doing so. Lightfoot later said it was a mistake and apologized. She battled the teachers' union. When the schools to reopen after being shut down for nearly a year over COVID, she blasted the teachers' union for staging what she called an illegal walkout when they voted to return to online teaching. And, of course, out came the race and gender card. She says she's being treated differently because she's a black woman. Lightfoot said, and I'm quoting her, I remember former Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel appearing on the cover of Time magazine, and the headline was basically like, Tough Guy for Chicago. No woman or woman of color is ever going to get that headline. End of quote. Calls a crime crisis. And gun owners of America echoes that point. The Biden administration is claiming that it's firearms that are committing crimes. It's not. It's criminals that are committing crimes. Meanwhile, President Biden continues to call on Congress to act. Reporting from the White House, at Tsao with TV News. The latest on the GOP's investigation into the Biden family's money trail. The Treasury Department is now allowing the Republican-led Oversight Committee to review suspicious activity reports. And TV's Melina Weiskopf has the details on the years-long probe. More transparency could soon be coming regarding the Biden family's business transactions, specifically with regards to the president's son, Hunter Biden, and his brother, James Biden. Now, this is after Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer subpoenaed Bank of America, and two months after Comer requested more information from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen regarding the Biden family's suspicious business transactions that have been flagged by U.S. banks. The Treasury Department is now complying and will provide the committee with an in-camera review of suspicious activity reports related to what the GOP describes as unusual foreign or high dollar transactions. Now, this specifically is related to the Biden family's dealings with a now bankrupt Chinese energy company. This investigation has been a top priority for House Republicans since they took the majority. Chairman Comer wrote in a statement that bank documents that the committee already has reveals a $3 million wire from a Chinese energy company two months after Joe Biden left vice presidency. And that soon after, hundreds of thousands of dollars in payouts went to members of the Biden family. Chairman Comer revealing that there's another Biden family member in the mix, but wouldn't specify exactly who. Here's a look. We assumed was this was just about the president's son and two brothers. But now there's a new name that's emerged. So, and, and they are a Biden. The president has denied any involvement in his son's overseas business dealings, and Democrat ranking member on the Oversight Committee, Congressman Jamie Raskin, accused Chairman Comer of using his authority in hopes of attacking the president and boosting former President Trump's re-election efforts. And Chairman Comer pushes back, saying that he has not spoken with Trump about this investigation, arguing that it's purely about protecting national security. Now, Comer also uh, recently subpoenaed a Treasury Secretary official requiring him to testify for an interview, although since the Treasury has now agreed to comply with the committee uh, by providing them with these suspicious activity reports, that interview is now postponed. Reporting People know these names have to go. Why is that? Whenever you have something to be proud of, people have less of a chance of controlling you. This country is racist from top to bottom, from right to left. And the black people to become part of that is for them to become in fact anti-black and to hate themselves. Just my friends. There is no country in this world a black person would rather be. Unless, of course, they grow up. Between the rank and file and the, uh, the management class. And uh, as you climb that ladder, it's tending to become more and more political. And I think there's an argument to be made that the FBI has now just become a, a weaponized apparatchik of the, uh, of the presidential administration. And, and we've seen that air out with the uh, prosecution of pro-life activists and uh, failing to, to prosecute anybody who's protesting outside of the Supreme Court Justice's House with the intent of influencing their decisions. You know, it seems really difficult to be able to maintain that uh, 
that neutral, nonpartisan stance uh, when, you know, you're a human being after all, and things have just been so uh, politicized and hyperpartisan. Um, how has the issue of political bias within the FBI impacted uh, public trust, would you say? I think it's been absolutely negative. Uh, I think that bears itself out with the, the polling that's done. The approval now for the FBI is uh, circling the drain. It's, it's now under 50%. And unfortunately, when you have the director come forward and, uh, and quote the uh, the number of applicants to uh, to be his metric for measuring success and, and approval of his agency, uh, he's just not taking the temperature of the room. You know, he does not think that the uh, the FBI clearly serves the American public. I think he probably views the FBI as being more of a client service to the the leaders in the administration. I want to learn more about the significance of the case and the appeal for New Yorkers. And for the nation. Bobby Ann Cox, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for joining us. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Now, last year you secured a landmark victory in a case against New York Governor Kathy Hochul's controversial quarantine camps regulation, but she's just filed an appeal. What's your initial response here? So my initial response is, um, a bit of surprise. Uh, they did have six months from the time that they filed their notice of appeal. So um, I'm surprised. I'm also a little bit shocked because, um, you know, it is quite a strong decision that the judge had issued last year. So um, it's a little surprising that they're challenging this. And on what grounds is Hochul appealing? Um, so they are making a few different arguments in their appeal. Um, of course, they're challenging the standing of my plaintiffs, and um, I am representing a group of New York State legislators in this case, Senator George Borrello, Assemblyman Chris Tate, Assemblyman Mike Lawler, who's now Congressman Mike Lawler, and um, also a citizens group called Uniting New York State. So, yeah, one of the arguments uh, is that none of my plaintiffs have standings. I don't think that is a, a valid argument. Um, and then they have some other arguments they put in there about, uh, you know, claiming that their regulation is constitutional and such. So it'll be very interesting. A lot, a lot of different arguments going on. Mm. And on what grounds do the legislators have standing in this case? In essence, what we're saying here is the wrong branch of government has issued um, a law, right? We're calling it a law. They're calling it a regulation. The Department of Health issued this regulation, and the Department of Health sits under Governor Kathy Hochul. That's the wrong branch of government. Um, they are not supposed to be issuing regulations that conflict with existing New York state law, which this regulation does. It conflicts with existing law, which we've had on the books for 70 years, which tells you how you need to isolate or quarantine somebody if they are conducting themselves in an improper manner and um, they have a communicable disease that is dangerous to other people around them. So it, it absolutely conflicts with existing law. And so basically, by doing this, the governor has taken power from the New York State Legislature, whereby harming the members of the legislature. So um, that is the basis upon which we have standing in this case. And what would it mean if the ruling is overturned? So if this ruling is overturned, I really think we're going to see the floodgates open. I think we're going to see agencies, not just the Department of Health, but other agencies as well, that will say, okay, well, if that ruling was overturned, that means we can make any kind of regulation we want, even if it conflicts with existing New York state law, and even if it conflicts with our Constitution, you know, hey, it doesn't matter. So we can just make any kind of regulation we want. Um, and that's very dangerous because departments like the Department of Health, for example, are made up of unelected bureaucrats. So the voters don't have an opportunity to vote those people out, right? You can only vote in and out the members of the New York State Legislature, right? The senators and the assembly members. Just in Stanford, the University of Denver, um, there's an independent organization that gives ratings to the New York City universities, uh, many of whom are getting F's for, you know, fostering and enabling the same type of anti-Semitic behavior. And the concern I truly have is troubling is this current scenario you're describing is it's, you know, where does it, where does it end? You know, once these anti-Semites are empowered with simple vandalism, that's the next step is, is in physical intimidation and fighting and beating up and things of that nature.
Jeff, how has the Department of Education responded to these, uh, you know, accusations? And what steps can be taken to prevent anti-Semitic behavior on college campuses and other places in the future? Um, what we're trying to do is at truthtells.org, we're raising money to um, to educate the Jewish population of this hypocrisy that many of their Jewish elected leaders tolerate and even elevate this mantra. Um, but as it relates to the educational system, we believe that it, we're going to start hitting on a state-by-state basis and getting to the Department of Education on how important it is to sustain Holocaust education. This is something that transcends religion. On the same time, how do we eliminate the BDS um, education that's going to the to the uh, to the students? And as a matter of fact, most of the surveys that you read, the articles you read, the, the universities like a Stanford are the ones who promote pushing this uh, BDS philosophy on campus, and that just has to stop. Unfortunately, our Jewish leaders aren't taking the lead. Jeff Burke, really uh, appreciate you joining us, shedding some light on this important issue. Eleanor, or Ellie for short, ultrasound testing is one way for parents to learn about their unborn child. While the procedure often reveals cute poses, a Yale University doctor says a peace sign like this is highly uncommon. You know, the cable channels asking that One America Newsmax and Fox News be removed because of so-called misinformation we were spreading. And apparently AT&T has complied. We're one of the highest rated cable news channels. We're number four in the nation. We're one of the top cable channels. We're in the top 20. We have a Nielsen rating that makes us the 16th highest rated daytime cable channel in America. And there's a couple of hundred of these cable channels they track. So it's a really big thing. Um, and it's pretty clear to us they were trying to close us down. They were making us accept the deal. They would essentially, essentially put Newsmax out of business. Well, what was the deal they, they tried to offer you? Then I want to get into kind of the, what they're saying about it. What was the deal? Yeah, well, you can talk just, it. you know, everybody in cable business gets a license fee. So when you pay your cable or satellite bill, they in turn pay CNN and Fox and ESPN and HBO, all these networks get a fee. And so Newsmax is a new channel was seeking a cable fee. And last year, hundreds of cable systems signed up for us to get a fee because we have such high ratings, a very modest fee of about $1 per year per subscriber. So to give you some idea on this, CNN gets $14 per subscriber. It's a lot of money. There's 22 liberal news channels that DirecTV and AT&T carry. Every one of them gets a fee. Every one of them is a multiple of that dollar that we were asking for. And most of them have lower ratings than Newsmax does, so it's a pretty incredible thing. And what AT&T said to Newsmax was this. We were not eligible to get any fee. We were not even going to get one penny, which is pretty shocking. Like, why would we be targeted and discriminated that we're not eligible to get a fee, but everybody else in the industry does? So they knew that they essentially closed us down as a news channel because you need those fees to operate. And all our other cable agreements are linked together. So everybody gets in the industry the lowest rate. So if we go to zero at DirecTV, uh, all our other agreements go to zero. So they're pretty clever on how they did this. Um, and and we're fighting back. And anybody that looks at this, you know, has sees it as censorship. Um, and President Trump and others have spoken out on it. Well, so I was reading some of the, you know, legacy news outlet coverage on this, and what they're saying is they're blaming it on low rating. Huge amount of calls where, you know, President Trump has urged people to call into DirecTV and AT&T to cancel not only... The two-minute song is titled Justice for All and features the J6 Prison Choir singing the Star-Spangled Banner interspersed with Trump reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. The song was released on March 3rd and surpassed Flowers by Miley Cyrus to reach the number one spot on March 11th. Many January 6th defendants have found themselves incarcerated in the same wing of a Washington, D.C. facility. As many of the inmates remained in the prison for months awaiting their trials, they began to sing the national anthem every night at 9 p.m. The J6 Prison Choir formed as a result of this nightly tradition. Forbes reported that Trump recorded his portion of the song a couple weeks prior at his Mar-a-Lago home in Florida. And coming up... A
two minute song is titled Justice for All and features the J6 Prison Choir singing the Star Spangled Banner interspersed with Trump reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. The song was released on March 3rd and surpassed Flowers by Miley Cyrus to reach the number one spot on March 11th. Many January 6 defendants have found themselves incarcerated in the same wing of a Washington, D.C. facility. As many of the inmates remained in the prison for months awaiting their trials, they began to sing the national anthem every night at 9 p.m. The J6 Prison Choir formed as a result of this nightly tradition. Forbes reported that Trump recorded his portion of the song a couple weeks prior at his Mar-a-Lago home in Florida. And coming up.